What is a 1031 exchange? Um, we have a very complicated uh, definition of a 1031 exchange in the code. I've paraphrased it here. Uh, basically, a 1031 exchange is a swap of business or investment property for another piece of business or investment property. And if you do it correctly, um, through the 1031 exchange process, you're not paying any taxes. Okay, some common misconceptions. 1031 exchanges are not new. They've been around for a really long time, but they've just been, become very popular in the last 20 years. Um, 1031 exchange like kind doesn't necessarily mean similar use or service. So we get a lot of calls from clients. They'll call up and say, look, I'm selling a condo. Does that mean I have to buy another condo? No, you can buy, you know, like kind is very, is very broad in the real estate world. So you can sell a condo and buy a single family residence. You can sell a single family residence and buy an apartment complex. It's very interchangeable for 1031 exchanges. 1031 exchanges are not just for large investments. Um, although we have done an exchange for a transaction in excess of a billion dollars, but a lot of our exchanges are for one, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars. So don't be bashful in calling us if you have a two hundred thousand dollar transaction. Um, we'd love to work with you guys. So um, and and the cost to complete a 1031 exchange, uh, most of our transactions uh, for for a regular forward exchange range from six hundred ninety five dollars up to a little over a thousand dollars. Uh, for one sale and for one purchase. Okay, the benefits of a 1031 exchange. Obviously, when you're selling property and you have taxes that you owe, the biggest benefit of a 1031 is you're not paying any taxes. There are some other hidden benefits that maybe some people aren't aware of. Number, number two up here is a greater buying power or leverage. In other words, if you're selling a property and you're not giving money to the IRS, that means you have more money in your pocket to go out and buy your next property. If you've got more money to buy your next property, that's a, that's a better down payment. It means you can buy a better, more expensive property. Um, increase income cash flow. So if you have a property like a farm, um, you know, great property, but a farm doesn't really generate any income, and you want to sell that farm, and you want to go into a property like an apartment complex or a condo or a single family residence where you can rent those properties out and generate income, you can do a 1031 and sell that farm and and go into a property that generates rents, rents for you. What about management relief? Sometimes you have a property as a real estate investor, um, and as you get older maybe, you, you, you get tired of fixing toilets and leaky faucets. You can sell a property that has a high management relief, or excuse me, you can sell a property where you're having to manage that property a lot, fix a lot of toilets, um, uh, repair carpet, et cetera. You can go out of that property in a 1031 and go in, into a property where there's not a lot of, it, of management. Um, diversification or consolidation. Um, you, can, you can have a situation where you're selling a bunch of properties um, in a 1031 and go into one larger property, or you can sell one larger property and go into a bunch of smaller ones um, through the 1031 program. Relocation or expansion of business. So um, what if you live in California and you, like, you, you have a bunch of rental property in Southern California and you're moving to Utah um, and and as a real estate investor, a lot of real estate investors like to be close to their property. Some don't, but some do. Um, you can move out of California, move to Utah, sell all your stuff in California on a 1031 exchange, and then swap it for property in Utah. The 1031 exchange uh, program is a federal statute, meaning you can cross state lines. You can do 1031 exchanges um, in any of the 50 states. Can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Okay. All right. When to, when to suggest doing a 1031 exchange? Well, as a, as a real estate investor, you should be thinking about doing a 1031 exchange anytime you sell a property that you don't live in it. If it's your primary residence, not a good property for a 1031, but if it's a property that you don't live in, you should at least consider um, doing a 1031 exchange, meaning um, call us and we can kind of um, talk to you about whether it makes sense to do a 1031 or you can call your CPA or you can call someone like DFY. And, and they can assist you with that process. When is it, late, when is it too late to set up a 1031 exchange? So um, in our industry, I get a lot of calls from uh, clients where, you know, title companies or clients will call us and say, look, we've, cl we've closed on a property three days ago and the money is just sitting with the title company. We haven't touched the money yet. Money's just still sitting with the title company. Um, so what happens if, if, 
if you've closed and the money's just sitting with the title company, is it too late to set up a 1031 exchange? Got a lot of people nodding their heads. Yes, yes, unfortunately, we are in the business of setting up exchanges and we want to set up that exchange for you, but if it's already closed, um, even if you haven't touched the money yet, it's too late to set up the 1031 exchange. And so, um, you know, make sure if you have a property that you don't live in, um, make sure you call us or DFY or call a CPA um, and talk about whether a 1031 exchange is um, something that's beneficial for you. And if it is, get it set up before closing. Once it closes, it's too late. But if you're, um, if you're sitting at the closing table, if you're sitting at the closing table and you're getting ready to sign um, the settlement statement and all the documents related, related to closing, um, it's not too late to set up the exchange at that point. So don't be bashful, give us a call. Uh, it takes us 15 to 20 minutes to set up the exchange. And so we'll get those documents over to the title company, we'll email those documents over, and we can still get the, the exchange set up if you're sitting at the closing table. Once it closes and you've left the title company, it's too late. Okay, um, if, you're, if you're doing an exchange, if you're selling a property and you wanna do a 1031 exchange, it's very important to tell your realtor that uh, you need some 1031 cooperation language in your contract. So we're talking about the contract for the property that you're selling, and we're talking about the contract for the property that you're purchasing. Um, it's very basic language. A lot of realtors will have access to this language through the Board of Realtors. Um, they can just get a 1031 addendum where it notifies all the parties to the transaction that the seller, if you're the seller, or the buyer, if you're the buyer, is doing a 1031 exchange. So make sure if you're doing a 1031 exchange, you have 1031 cooperation language in your contract. And of course, if you're not working with a realtor, or if your realtor doesn't have access to that language, call us and we'll, we will email you that language for your contract. Okay, capital gains. Uh, what is a capital gain? Um, anytime you sell something, uh, whether it's a baseball card, whether it's a piece of artwork, or a piece of real estate, anytime you sell something for more than you paid for it, then you're going to have a capital gain. The difference is a, is, is a capital gain and you're going to pay taxes on that. So the concept of capital gain. So let's take a very basic example. Selling a, you bought a property for $100,000 and on a 1031, um, your adjusted cost is basically what you bought the property for plus any capital improvements that you made to the property during your ownership, less depreciation. So you, you bought a property for $100,000, your adjusted cost is $100,000 because you didn't, you didn't put anything into it. You sell a property for $200,000 and the difference is going to be $100,000 and that's your capital gain. By the way, if you guys have any questions, you can certainly ask me. <clears throat> okay. Capital gains taxes and depreciation recapture. Okay, so let's assume you have a piece of real estate and you're selling it and you're not doing a 1031 exchange. So if you're not doing an exchange, you're paying taxes, right? Well, the first round of taxes that you're gonna pay if you're not doing an exchange are federal taxes. Uh, on the federal level, if you're selling a property and you didn't own that property for at least a year, then the tax rate that you'll pay is your ordinary income tax rate. So whatever tax bracket you're in, that's the tax you're gonna pay on your capital gains. If you've owned the property for at least one year and a day or more, then you're in the capital gains rates, which are 15% for most people. If you make more than 400,000 400, as, as an individual or 450 as a married couple, then your capital gain rate is 20%. Yes, sir. Is this working? Okay. All right. Okay, so um, going back to this, if you've owned the property for less than a year, you're paying ordinary income tax. If you've owned the property for one year and a day or more, it's 400, or excuse me, it's 20%, sorry, it's 15% for most individuals, 20% if you make more than 400 or 450 as a married couple. If you make more than 200,000, as an individual or 250 as a married couple, then there's also a 3.8% Medicare tax that the federal government is going to sneak into your real estate um, transaction. So um, this is another round of taxes that you'll have to pay. We talked about that. 
Um, so, so you're going to pay federal taxes. You're going to pay the sneaky 3.8% uh, Medicare tax. Um, another round of taxes are the state taxes. And so state taxes are going to vary from state to state. Here in Utah, it's around 5%. Um, so 5% here in Utah if you sell a property and you don't do a 1031. The third round of taxes are going to be a, rec a recapture of depreciation. So when you own investment property, every year when you file your tax return, there's a significant tax credit um, for depreciation. And most people take that depreci de uh, depreciation every year on their tax return. And when you sell that property, the IRS wants some of it back. And it's called a recapture of depreciation. And that rate is 25%. So 20 25 cents on every dollar that you depreciated of that property, the IRS wants back. So if you don't do a 1031, you're paying federal tax, you're paying the Medicare tax maybe, you're paying state taxes, and you're paying a depreciation recapture. So let's, knowing all of that information now, let's use a sort of basic real life example. Let's assume that you've owned a property for many years, you paid $50,000 for that property, didn't make any capital improvements, but you did depreciate that property down to zero. Now you're selling that property for $100,000. Okay, so here on the left-hand side, it's a typical sale. That means you're selling it and you're not doing a 1031 exchange. On the right-hand side, you're doing a 1031 exchange. So if you sell a property for $100,000 and you're not doing an exchange, under this scenario, you're paying Twelve thousand five hundred as a depreciation recapture. Why twelve thousand five hundred? Well, you bought the property for fifty thousand and you depreciated that property down to zero. That's fifty thousand dollars of depreciation. The IRS wants twenty five uh, twenty five percent of that back, meaning um, twenty five percent of fifty thousand dollars is twelve five twelve thousand five hundred. Okay, so the federal tax is going to be seventy five hundred under, under this example. Why, uh, why 7,500? Well, you bought the property for 50,000. It appreciated to, to 100,000. And so that's $50,000 of gain. And at 15% federal, for most people, 15% of $50,000 is $7,500. There are some stars next to this number because if you make 200,000 as an indivi individual or 250 as a married couple, then there's a 3.8% Medicare tax. 3.8% times $50,000 of capital gains is $1,900. If you make more than $400,000 as an individual or $450,000 as a married couple, you're also going to pay this $2,500 of additional capital gains tax. Why? Because um, the capital gains rate goes up to 20% for those that make $400,000 as an individual or $450,000 as a married couple. State taxes are $2,500. Again, your gain on this example was $50,000, and 5% of $50,000 is $2,500. So the gist of this is, is that if you're not doing a 1031, you're paying a lot of taxes here. Your total taxes is, is going to be $26,900, leaving you $73,100 um, in your pocket. That gives you a buying power of, on a 20% down model, it gives you a buying power of $365,500. Where if you don't do a ten or if you do do a, excuse me if you do do a 1031 exchange on the right hand side up here, you're not paying any of these taxes. Of course, you have to do the 1031 correctly, but if you do a 1031 exchange, you're not paying any of these taxes. It leaves you with the full $100,000 in your pocket, and you can go out and buy a property on a 20% down model of $500,000. Okay, uh, let's talk about the concept of boot. Um, boot is a funny term. It just basically means if you're doing a 1031 exchange, um, if you're doing a 1031 exchange, it doesn't mean that you're not paying taxes. And it really comes down, whether you pay taxes or not on a 1031 exchange comes down to whether you have boot in your exchange. And boot just means somewhere along the line, you received cash from the sale of your property in your own pocket. And if you receive cash in your own pocket, it's boot. Um, and that boot is, is taxable. So if you're doing a 1031 exchange, you want to avoid boot. You don't want boot because you don't want to pay taxes, right? So the, the two basic rules on a 1031 exchange to avoid boot are, number one, you want to trade for equal or greater value. 
If you sell for $100,000, you want to buy for $100,000 or greater, right? So number one, trade for equal or greater value. Number two, you want to trade all the money that you receive from the sale of your relinquished property, all the money that you receive the, from the sale of the property that you're selling, you want to use all that money towards the purchase of the new property. If you trade down in value, or if you trade down in equity or proceeds, or you know, if you keep some of that cash from the sale of your property, then you'll be taxed on the difference of that trade down. Okay, so uh, using that general, general rule, let's go through some examples here. Okay, so the relinquished property on the left-hand side, that's the property that you're selling in the exchange. Replacement property is the one that you're buying. Okay, so let's assume that you're selling a property for 300000 On that property, you have a loan of 100000 and, and equity of 200000 Well, you set up a 1031 exchange, you sell that property, and then you go into a new property and you buy a new property, and the new property is also 300000 You go out and get a loan of 100000 and you use all of your equity, $200,000, as a down payment on that property. So do we have any boot in this transaction? The people are nodding their head no. So no boot. And the reason for that is that we traded for equal or greater value. And we used all of this money that we received from the sale. We used it all towards the purchase. OK, so let's get in. Let's use a, a more difficult example here. Uh, so you're selling a property for 300. And on that property, you have, you have, a, you have equity of 200,000 and a loan of 100,000. So you sell that property, you do a 1031, and you come over here um, on the right-hand side, and you buy a property again for $300,000. But instead of using the full $200,000 of equity, you only use 150 of it. Um, instead of using the full 200, you go out and get a loan for 150. So your loan has increased by 50,000, and your equity has decreased by 50,000. So are we going to have boot on this transaction? So we're going to have boot. And the reason we have boot is that we had $200,000 that we received from the sale, and 50000 of that didn't get used. So the way that we see this in, in, in a real-life example is sometimes a client, sometimes a real estate investor, when they sell this property up here, um, they will instruct the title company to give them $50,000. So they have $200,000 coming to them, but they'll say, look, I want to do a 1031, but I, I only want 150 of it to go into the uh, to go into the 1031 exchange account, and I want 50,000 to come to me directly at closing. And so once they receive that 50,000, and that's okay to do, but once they receive that 50,000 dollars, it's taxable to them. Another way that we see it is the client will set up a 1031, and they'll they'll instruct that the full 200,000 will come to us, but when they go to buy their replacement property. As they start talking with their lender, um, they'll overshoot on the loan. And so all they really need here is a $100,000 loan, but they'll overshoot on that, and they'll get a, a loan that's too big for the property, too big for their transaction. And so then at closing, when they send the settlement statement around, and we see that um, the settlement statement is only asking for $150,000, we have a problem, right? Because we have $200,000 sitting in the exchange account, and the settlement statement is only calling for one hundred and fifty. dollars so we will send the 150 property, the replacement property will close, and then once the exchange is expired, we'll send the $50,000 that's sitting in the exchange account, we'll send that back to the client, and they'll have to pay taxes on that. Okay, so we have, we have one more example here. Client is selling for 300, they've got equity of 200, and a loan of 100, and uh, they go out and they buy another property for 200,000. So instead of you know buying for 300, they buy for 200 and no loan and they you know but they did use the full equity here. So they used all their equity and paid cash for that replacement property. So do we have boot here? We most certainly have boot here. So a lot of people, a lot of real estate investors, um, they want to get out of debt, right? They want to sell their property. They want to get out of debt. So a great idea is, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell this property. 
and I'm going to do a 1031 and not pay any taxes, right? But I'm also going to get out of debt, and, and this mortgage that I had on my old property, I'm just not going to get a new mortgage on the new property. I'm just going to trade down in value and just pay cash for the new property. Well, we know because we've been talking about it, you have to trade for equal or greater value. And so as great as it sounds to get out of debt, you do have to replace that mortgage um, over here. And so that's why they call it mortgage boot, because you didn't replace the mortgage. And you know there, there are ways to solve this problem here. This client, this person, this real estate investor could solve this problem by going and buying a second property in their exchange for at least $100,000. Um, you don't have to replace, you don't, ha you don't have to, you're not limited to just one property, you can do two properties. And so um, they need to buy a second property here. Okay, the qualified intermediary. In our, in our industry, the qualified intermediary is called the QI. So I'm gonna refer to the qualified intermediary as the QI. Can everyone still hear me? Pre okay, okay. Okay, so who I what is the qualifi qualified in intermediary, the QI? Uh, that's who we are. First American Exchange is the QI. And the QI is someone that prepares all the requisite 1031 documents at closing. So when you sell your property, you have 1031 documents. When you buy your property, you have 1031 documents. Um, you also have to identify in your 1031 exchange. And as the QI, we assist you with all of that documentation. But the QI also holds on to the money. So in a 1031 exchange, the IRS requires that when you sell your property in a 1031 exchange, the money has to be held by a third party. So uh, the QI is that third party. Um, and our, our company acts as a QI. So <coughs> who cannot be the QI? So you can't, you know, we actually get this, um, we get this question every once in a while. We'll get a call from a real estate investor that'll say, I want to do an exchange, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to pay someone like you guys, First American, um, to be the QI. Can I have my neighbor, or can I have my CPA, or can I have my attorney, or can I have my relative be the QI? And of course, um, none of those people can be the QI because what the IRS says is that, that an agent of the taxpayer or the real estate investor doing the exchange cannot be the QI. It's got to be a third party. And so um, you've got to you've got to set it up through a legitimate third party QI service. Okay, so now we're getting to the good part here. Um, we have some newspaper clippings here. We have a lot of newspaper clippings. We talked about how the market, the real estate market from 2008, 2009, and 2010 was really a sad market for real estate. Um, I was working in that market I was doing exchanges. Um, I, I was in the same position that I'm in now. And, and of course, 2008, 2009, 2010, those were hard years for us. They were hard for years for me. Um, we weren't very busy. And so, but I, dis but I did have some competitors. And here, these new newspaper clippings are basically clippings of my competitors that left the market um, as QIs during that time frame. So we're going to talk about that. So. How do you choose a QI? Well, the number one uh, company up here, um, Southwest Exchange. Southwest Exchange was a, was a company, was one of my competitors in 2008, 2009, and that's a company that went bankrupt during that time frame when, when the real estate market was, um, was sad. Southwest Exchange was supposed to have $97 million of, of, of real estate investor money, of 1031 money. Um, they filed bankruptcy, and and they didn't have that money. Why did why didn't they have that money? Because Southwest Exchange was a company that was owned by an individual. It was a small company, even though they had ninety seven million dollars. They were a small company, um, and small companies are not audited the same way that large companies are. There's a law, a federal law called Sarbanes Oxley, and and pursuant to Sarbanes Oxley, large companies like First American have to pay outside auditors on a quarterly basis. Every three months, we have to pay an Ernst & Young or a PricewaterhouseCoopers to come into our, um, our offices and check our financial books. And so every quarter, we have accountants coming in looking at our account or at all of our accounts to make sure that we're not doing anything weird with 
um, our client's money. Well, Southwest Exchange was a small company, not subject to the, those same audit restrictions. And so this guy that owned Southwest Exchange, he was stealing client money, and he was using client money, 1031 money, to sort of fund his own personal life. He was, he was also using the money to fund other business, um, other business ventures. And so by the time... Um, by the time people figured this out, um, the $97 million was gone. I mean, there was some of it was still left, but uh, he filed bankrupt, bankruptcy. And through the bankruptcy process, some people got some of their money back, but it took a really long time. And most people got pennies on the dollar um, in terms of getting their money back. Summit Exchange up here is number two. Summit Exchange is a company that was a... Um, again, a small company. They had an office in Oregon and they had an office in Park City, Utah. And during that same time frame, they went bankrupt. They were supposed to have $40 million and they had about $25 million at the time of their bankruptcy. Why did Summit Exchange go bankrupt? Uh, Summit Exchange was not committing fraud like the first company was. Um, but what Summit Exchange was doing was as a competitive, as a competitive advantage in our industry, one of the things that we do as a 1031 company is we hold your money and um, we charge you a fee to do the exchange, but we also offer a rate of return on your money. So your money might be sitting with us for 30 or 40 or 60 or 90 days, and during that time frame, we will offer you a rate of return, um, an interest rate. Some in exchange during that time frame as a competitive advantage over a company like us um, they were sticking their money in real estate projects. They were investing your 1031 money in real estate projects. And during that time frame of 2004, 5, 6, and 7, those real estate projects were, were doing really well. And so they were able to offer their clients that were doing exchanges with them a really good rate of return. And that rate of return was, was higher than our rate of return because at First American, we place your funds into a, into a bank account um, with a bank that you've heard of and it's an FDIC insured bank account and the money sits with the bank account um, with the bank until the exchange is done and then when you need it, we send it um, for the purchase of your property. Well, when you put money in a bank in an account that's fully liquid at all times, that interest rate isn't very high, but that's what we offer. Um, Some in exchange was killing us because they were able to offer a higher interest rate and people were going with them. Um, but obviously, when the market turned in 2008, 2009, 2010, those real estate projects that Summit Exchange was investing in, those projects went down, down as well with the, the real estate market. And so that was their problem. They weren't committing fraud, but they were just a little overly aggressive with their 1031 deposits. And again, First American, at First American, we place your deposits with a bank like Citibank, where you've heard of the bank, their FDIC insured accounts. Um, the interest rate isn't uh, super exciting, but um, the purpose of the exchange is for us to keep your exchange safe, your funds sa safe. Okay, so you guys kind of get the picture. Land America Exchange was also a company that went bankrupt. I have a client right now. We've done several exchanges for probably 10 years for this client. He did an exchange with Land America Exchange basically on a Friday during the same time frame, 2008, 2009, he set up an exchange with Land America Exchange, and on a Friday, his property closed, and the money from it, uh, the sale of his property went to Land America Exchange, and um, the following Monday, his money was gone because Land, Land America Exchange had filed bankrupt, uh, bankruptcy over the weekend. And so he sets up, ex sets up his exchange on a Friday, and on Monday, he finds out that the company that he chose had filed bankruptcy. Uh, Land America Exchange was not committing fraud. They weren't stealing money like Southwest Exchange was. But again, they were like Summit Exchange. They were taking their client money and they were putting those funds into investments that were a little bit too aggressive. Um, and as a result of that, when the market turned, they didn't have the money that they needed to, to pay their clients back. Okay, so now that I've scared everyone away from ever doing an exchange, that's not the purpose. Th that's really not the purpose, though. The purpose is, is that, um, you know, at the start of this presentation, I wanted to 
you know, one of the one of the key points for me was to say, why First American? Why would you use First American versus you know one of our competitors? And so when you look for a QI, the 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 thing that you want to look for number one is um, financial financial security, financial strength of the QI. Is the QI that you're choosing to work with a company that has deep pockets, or is it a company that's owned by one or two people? If you have a $500,000 deposit or a million dollar deposit, do you want to deposit that money with a company that's owned by an individual that doesn't even have that level of assets in his own account? So that if, if something happens um, with that person or with that company, you want to make sure that your money is there. And so with First American, we are wholly owned by First American Title Insurance Company, which is a national provider of title and escrow services. And our ultimate parent is a publicly traded company, First American Financial Corporation. And that company has assets um, in the billions of dollars. Again, we talked about this. When you're dealing with a large company, so we have deep pockets. We have a, you know, our company is a deep pocket. But we're also, also on a quarterly basis, we have outside auditors that come in and look at our books to make sure that we aren't doing weird things with your money, like stealing it, stealing it and using it for boats and and concert tickets and vacations. The second thing that you want to look at is whether the company that you're choosing has a fidelity bond. What is a fidelity bond? A fidelity bond is basically insurance, insurance for fraudulent acts. If I hire someone, if I make a bad hire, um, I have a team that does 1031 exchanges, and if I make a bad hire and I hire, and I hire someone that um, steals, your, steals your money, you know, Everyone knows of someone, um, whether it's 7-Eleven or a law firm, right? We know of people that have stolen money from their employer, right? Well, at our company, we are holding other people's money. We're, we're holding hundreds of millions of dollars. And so if I make a bad hire and one of my people, one of my employees steals money, siphons money from each one of these bank accounts and sends that money into their own account, well, we're going to find out, and we have insurance for that, and that's what the fidelity bond is for. And so at First American, our fidelity bond is $20 million. So when you choose your QI, make sure that you choose a QI that has that fidelity bond. Errors and emissions insurance. When you choose a QI, make sure that you choose a QI that has insurance for negligent acts. What's a negligent act? Well, if I hire someone that is just a... Well, let, let me back up. If I hire someone that makes a mistake, and as a result of that mistake, they lose your money, um, in our industry right now, we have, we have hundreds and thousands of 1031 exchange accounts. And so every day, we're constantly sending wires to title companies to fund properties. We're sending wires here and there, and, and it gets pretty hectic. Well, right now, there are internet hackers I know, I know this, sounds, this sounds weird, but it's, it's, it's very real. We have internet hackers, and right now the popular thing for internet hackers is to hack into title companies and exchange companies' emails and figure out what's going on with the transaction. They can figure out who you're working with, and they will hack into your system, and they'll send you an email and pretend to be someone that um, is involved in the transaction, and they'll send you fraudulent wiring instructions, and they'll get you, they'll trick you, into sending money to their account instead of to the title company's account or to the bank's account. So you're, you're meaning to send money to the right place, but you send it to the wrong place, um, a thief, and as a result of that, the money's gone, right? Well, if you're dealing with a company that has E&O insurance, errors and emissions insurance, that means that if I have a, an employee that makes a mistake um, and is tricked by sending the money to the wrong place, then we have insurance for that. When you choose a QI, you want to make sure that the QI is licensed. Not all states require that the QI be licensed in that state, but there are some states that do. And so First American Exchange is a national provider of 1031 exchange services, and we are licensed in every state that requires a license. Okay. Qualified property for the 1031 exchange. The like-kind requirement is very broad. <coughs> it just means you have to swap real estate for real estate. And so if you have a single family residence, you can swap it with raw ground. If you have an industrial property, you can swap it with retail. 
If you have an office, you can swap it with a barn, a farm. All these properties are interchangeable on the 1031 exchange program. What else is like kind? Well, you, you can sell a property at 100% ownership and you can go into a new property at a tenant in common ownership, meaning you're not buying the whole property, you're buying it with, uh, with other owners. So you can sell a 100% property and go into a percentage in interest property. You can sell a 30-year leasehold interest. You can sell conservation conservation easements and water rights. Water rights here in Utah are pretty popular. Um, the water right has to be something that's transferred by deed and not by a share in an irrigation company. Okay, so on the 1031 program, it has to be real estate for real estate. It also has to be U.S. property for U.S. property. We have clients that will set up an exchange, they'll sell their property, and the money will come to us, and then they'll leave and go on vacation, right? And so the money's sitting with us, they're in France, they're driving around France, and they'll call us up and say, look, I know I have to identify property, right? I've got this exchange set up with you guys. Um, can I use my money from my 1031 to buy a cute little chateau here in France? And of course, um, the IRS wants to keep potentially taxable money here in the United States, and so um, you can't sell a U.S. property and buy a chateau in France, and you also can't sell the Washington Monument and trade it for the, um, trade it for the Eiffel Tower. <coughs> so it's got to be U.S. property for U.S. property. Okay, so there's actually a question here from a viewer. Um, can, you, can you sell a property? So the question that I have here is that um, uh, can I use a 1031 exchange to sell a fourplex and invest in several single family rental properties? Well, on a 1031 exchange program, you can sell one large property and go into three smaller properties or vice versa, sell three properties and go into a large property. So yes, you can sell a fourplex and go into four single family residences if you want to. Um, you, just, you just need to make sure that the values are there. So you still wanna trade for equal or greater value, but you can combine you can combine four properties to get you where, um, to where you need to be on that valuation. Okay, qualified use requirements. So we talked about it has to be real estate for real estate. It has to be U.S. property for U.S. property. It's also got to be business or investment property for business or investment property. So the, the way that you use the property is important. So with that in mind, if this is your primary residence, this is a really nice looking house. If this is your primary residence, it's not a property that you can do a 1031 exchange with. But, but if this is a property, even though it looks like a primary residence, if this is a property that you're renting to a third party, then um, it's a good property for a 1031. Vacation homes. What if you have a home, St. George, Park City, um, you know, if you have a home that you want to buy or that you currently own, you want to sell on a 1031, and it's a home that you use for personal use, but you also rent it out, that's a vacation home. If it's a vacation home, um, you can do a 1031 exchange, but there are certain guidelines. And so basically, what the guidelines are is that for a two-year period before you sell a vacation home, you have to rent that property out for 14 days per year, and you have to limit your personal use to either 14, 14 days per year or to 10% of the rental period for that particular year. So before you sell a vacation home, make sure that you fit within those guidelines. And then if you buy a vacation home on a 1031, again, two year for a two year period, rent it out for 14 years, uh, 14 days per year, and limit your personal use to either 14 days per year or 10% of the rental period for that year. Okay, we've covered all of those topics. Mixed use properties. Well, sometimes you have a property like a farm, a bed and breakfast, or a duplex. Sometimes you have a property like that where you live on the property and it's your primary residence, but it's also a property that you rent out as an investment property. So we know you can't do a 1031 with a primary residence, right? But you can do a 1031 with an investment property. What if the property has a combination of both of those uses? Well, you can do a 1031 exchange for the investment side of your property. So if you own a duplex and you live in that duplex, you can sell that duplex and you can carve out the value of that duplex 
that was your primary residence, and you can take your primary residence um, exemption of 250 for an individual or 250 or 500 uh, for a married couple, and then you can carve out the value of that duplex um, and do a 1031 exchange on the investment side of that duplex. Stock and trade doesn't qualify for a 1031. So basically what we're talking about here is that the, the IRS, they don't want home builders or developers like Donald Trump to do 1031 exchanges. And so if you're buying large pieces of property, large tracts of land, and you're cutting up those lands and subdividing that those large tracts of land and then selling off either lots or building homes and selling off homes, or if you're Donald Trump and you buy um, you know, big pieces of property on Las Vegas Boulevard and you're, you're building a high-rise condo tower and then you're selling condo units. Um, those, are, those are considered stock and trade in our industry. And basically, if you're a developer and you develop real estate that way, it's not really, the 1031 exchange program is not really uh, the right program. Okay. So we've talked about the property has to be real estate for real estate. It has to be U.S. for U.S. It's got to be business or investment for business or investment. So let's talk about the time frames. When you do a 1031, you get 45 days to identify, 180 days to close. So here we have day zero. Day zero is the date that you're sitting at the title company, signing the settlement statement, signing all your, your documents. Day zero is the, is the day of closing of the relinquished property. On day one, we will send you an email with a welcome packet. The welcome packet will have all your deadlines, a summary of all your deadlines. We'll provide you with an identification form um, for the 1031, and we'll, we'll give you a statement of account showing the money that we have in your 1031 exchange. So here's the 45 days that you get to identify, and then 180 days to close. Here's what the identification form looks like. So on day one, we're going to send you an email. We're going to send you a copy of this identification form. It's really easy. You just get three slots here. Um, you can put in three addresses. You sign it, you date it, and then you email it back to my office. Can you identify more than three properties? Well, under certain, circumsta under certain circumstances, you can go above three properties. If you go above three properties, you just need to make sure that you add up the value of all the properties on your list, and the total value of all the properties on your list cannot be more than two times the value of the property that you sold. So if you sell for $100,000 and you only identify three properties or less, it doesn't matter how much those properties are worth. Of course, you want to trade for equal or greater value, um, but there's no limitation on, on the value of the properties that are on your identification form. But if you go to the fourth property, then all of a sudden you have to worry about the values. You've got to add up all the values and you've got to make sure that the, the total combined value of all the properties on your list is not more than 200,000 under that $100,000 example. Okay, so here's some tips for maximizing the ID period because honestly in a 2018 real estate market, it's really hard to find good property, right? Um, you know, you've got, um, You've got a lot of buyers out there. You've got multiple offers. You've got, um, it's really hard to find property, especially if you, you know, you get a property under contract and then you do your due diligence and you find a bad foundation or you find out that there's, you know, uh, um, a cow farm across the street that makes, the, makes it smell really bad. So it's really hard to find good property. And so what do you do if you're going to do a 1031 exchange? If you're doing a, an exchange and you know you're doing a 1031 exchange, um, you don't want to wait until your property closes to start looking for property, right? You want to you want to start looking for property the minute you know you're going to do a 1031 exchange, which is um, before you even sell your relinquished property. You need to be out looking for property so that when your 45 days starts ticking, you know you kind of have a game plan. You know exactly what it is um, that you're going to. Put on, put on your identification form so that it's not a, um, a risk. We have lots of clients that are just not able to identify property during the 45-day period. We have lots of clients that do identify property, and then they get to the end of the 45 days, and those properties just, just don't work out. And so 
you want to you wanna really be looking for property before you sell your relinquished property. Okay, holding requirements. The question comes up, well, I have a property. I've held the property for six months. Is that enough time to sell the property and do a 1031 exchange? Is there a holding period requirement um, with Section 1031? And, of course, um, it's a common question, but there is no specific holding rule. There's no specific period of time in Section 1031. A lot of CPAs will say one year. Most CPA, CPAs will say two years, but that's just a rule of thumb. There's no specific bright line rule in Section 1031 as to a holding period. Okay, so with that, we're going to play a little game. The real Estate Millionaire. So you're doing a 1031 exchange. You want to do a 1031 exchange. How long must a person who owns property, how long, how, mu how long must a person own a piece of property before they can do a 1031 exchange? Is it A, one year, B, two years, C, no IRS guidance, D, one tax filing period? Okay, so we have... Um, is it Miss D. Francesca? Yes. Okay. Um, no IRS guidance. So you will get some CPAs that will tell you, as a rule of thumb, that you should hold it one year. You will get some CPAs that will say, as a rule of thumb, hold it for two years. But the real answer here is there's no IRS guidance because Section 1031 is completely silent on this issue. Well, the accountant will tell you that because they're they're trying to minimize risk for you. Um, even though I mean, even though there's no specific time frame, they feel like two years is a good rule of thumb that you're you're going to be okay. It's not a guarantee, but it's it, that's why it's a rule of thumb. They they might say, well, we've never had in the 20 years that I've been practicing as a CPA, we've never had someone that's held the property for at least two years. Um, have their 1031 exchange overturned because of, um, you know, not holding it for a long period, long enough period of time. So, it's a rule of thumb that. Well, and 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 to be honest, there are other. I should also mention, two years is, is a two years is popular because there are other sections of the code, not section 1031. There are other sections of the code where the IRS uses a two-year rule as an important time frame, and so they've kind of they've kind of adopted that two-year time frame from other sections of the code. So with the holding requirement, the length is not defined in the regulations. The key is the intent of the taxpayer at the time the taxpayer acquired the property. So what the IRS will look at if they audit your file is, what were you thinking as a real estate investor when you bought this property? Were you thinking, I'm going to buy this property and hold it and rent it out? Or as a real estate investor, were you thinking, oh, I'm going to buy this property. I'm going to put some new paint in the, um, on the walls and I'm gonna put some new carpet on the floors, and then I'm going to immediately put the property on the market to try to sell it. So, the IRS wants you to see the IRS wants to see the real estate investor that is going to hold it and rent it versus, um, you know, fix it up and flip it. So that's the that's the key distinction. Title parking exchanges. We're going to cover this really quickly. Um, if you're wanting to do a 1031 exchange, and you're in a situation. Most 1031 exchanges are situations where you're selling first and buying second. Well, if you're in a situation where you want to buy first, you find a perfect property that you want to buy first, and then you have a property in mind that you want to sell, but you need to sell it after um, you buy the new property, then you can do a 1031. It's called a, re a reverse 1031 exchange. So it is available. In a reverse exchange, um, and, and we talked about that, so what are the reasons for a reverse exchange? Well, you know, in this market, in, two, in a 2018 market, it's really hard to find a good property, right? It's easier to sell than it is to buy. Well, if you go out and find a really good property and you want that property, you need to move on it. And so you want to get it under contract and you want to get it purchased. And then you can figure out later what you're going to sell. And because things are selling so quickly, um, it's a lot easier to run it through the reverse 1031 program and sell your property 
within 180 days on the 1031. So that's, the, that's just the, the biggest reason that we see for reverse exchanges. So in a reverse exchange, basically you need to hire an exchange accommodation title holder. So First American Exchange, we are a QI, we hold the money in the 1031 exchange program, but we're also an exchange accommodation title holder. So if you need to set up a reverse exchange, you come to us, and we, as an exchange accommodation title holder, will buy and acquire the new property, the one that you want to buy. We will acquire that property. Um, we still have to borrow money from you guys, the real estate investor, but we'll buy the property, we'll hold it, and that gives you 180 days to sell your old property. When you sell your old property, um, the money from the sale comes to us as your QI, and then we will, um, we will complete the reverse exchange by transferring ownership of the new property to you, get to the party doing the exchange, and then we'll use the money that we received from the sale to reimburse the, tax, uh, the real estate investor for the money that the real estate investor loaned to us to purchase that new property. Um, rever reverse exchanges are difficult in a residential market because um, in order to do a reverse exchange on a residential piece of property, you basically have to pay cash for that property. So um, if there's a lender involved, outside lender involved, institutional type lender, it's really, it's really difficult to do a, a reverse exchange. Why? Because lenders just don't cooperate with um, this whole, the 1031 company um, acquiring and holding the property for, for six months. Okay, so we've talked about that. Um, how are we doing on time, by the way? Like, we're good. And how long do, were you expecting this to go? Okay. I think we're, I think we're about 10 minutes away. Okay. Okay, so let's go through some special exchange issues. These are issues that come up over and over and over again in our industry. And so, so basically the same taxpayer requirement. So when you do a 1031 exchange, um, the way that you sell your property needs to be the same way that you buy your new property. So Mark Bullock sells a property in his individual name, then Mark Bullock needs to acquire the new property, right? Well, if it's Mark Bullock and Emily Bullock, that's my wife's name, then on the new property, it's got to be Emily or Mark Bullock and Emily Bullock as husband and wife. If you sell the property as Mark Bullock LLC, then you got to buy the new property as Mark Bullock LLC or Mark Bullock Corporation. You got to buy the, the next property as Mark Bullock Corporation. So if you sell as a corporation, as an LLC, a trust, or as an individual, you've got to purchase the next property in your exchange the same way that you sold. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, so before we play this game, we'll talk about the exceptions. Okay, so the general rule is that you have to buy the, the new property the same way that you sold your old property. The two notable exceptions are, number one, if it's a single member LLC, for, for, for whatever reason, the IRS considers a single member LLC to be a pass-through entity. It's a disregarded entity for tax purposes. So a, a single member LLC is interchangeable with the single member that owns that LLC. So if you sell as a single member LLC, you can go into the new property in that same LLC name, or you can go into that new property in the name of that sole member, or you can set up a totally new LLC as long as that new LLC is owned by the same sole member as the old LLC. The other exception is a, is a living trust. If it's a revocable living trust or a grantor trust, um, same thing. That trust is a, is a disregarded tax entity and um, it doesn't have its own tax status. It, it, it flows to the owner of that trust and so those are interchangeable. And so with that um, explanation, we're gonna play another game of Real Estate Millionaire. Okay, so I probably should have been standing here the whole time. If, if an exchanger sells a property through a revocable living trust, then they must take title to the next property, the replacement property, A, in the trust, B, as an individual, C, under a new entity with the trust as a sole member, or D, all options. This is a difficult one because we're basically taking the general rule, the general being that you have to acquire 
the new property the same way that you so sold the old property. We're taking that general rule, and we are exploiting the two exceptions to that rule, which are a single member LLC and a, and a living trust. And so if you're selling as a revocable living trust, then <coughs> a, a, is, a is correct because if you sell as a living trust, you can certainly take title to the next property in, a, in the same living trust. B is correct because um, a living trust is interchangeable with the individual that owns that trust, and so you could choose to buy the next property in the name of the individual that owns that trust. Um, C is correct because a single member LLC is a disregarded entity just like a trust, and so the trust could choose to buy the next property as the sole member of a new single member LLC, and that would be fine. And so basically, all options are correct here. Okay, what about refinancing? So um, you're, doing a, you're selling a property, and you want to do a 1031, and you want to be smart. You want to, uh, before closing, you want to pull all the equity out of that property through a refinance, pull all the money out of that property, put it in your pocket so that you don't have to actually send that money forward towards the purchase of your new replacement property. C can you do that? Is that okay? Um, well, it's, it's typically not okay to do a refinance of your relinquished property within a short time frame before you sell that property on a 1031 exchange. And so don't pull out all of your equity two or three months um, before you sell that relinquished property on a 1031. Don't pull out all the equity through a refi because that's where the IRS is gonna come in and say, uh, we really wanted that money to go forward and be used towards the purchase of the replacement property. You pulled it out before closing. We don't like that. We're gonna we're gonna consider that to be taxable boot and, and and charge you taxes on that. It's generally it's generally considered okay to do a 1031 exchange and buy your replacement property. And then after you buy your replacement property and close on your replacement property, it's generally considered to be okay to refinance that replacement property and pull equity out at that point in time. Um, a couple of things that you want to consider is you want to have a time buffer between the actual purchase of that replacement property and the actual refinance. You don't know how long of a time buffer, but you certainly don't want to have the purchase and the refinance on the same day. So have a time buffer, and then you want to have a legitimate business reason for making that refi, uh, for pulling that equity out. Some sort, of, some sort of business reason for doing that, not just to put the money um, in your account to have that money to um, you know, buy uh, personal things like cars and vacations. Okay, so we've reached the end. I, I really appreciate the opportunity um, to, to be here. Um, I actually, sorry, I actually have a couple of questions here um, and then we'll be done. Okay, so we answered one of the questions. Um, second question here from the viewers is, is there a limit on the number of properties that I can buy? Can I buy four, five, six properties? So there is no limitation on the number of properties that you can buy. In theory, you can buy 100 properties if you wanted to. If you sold your property on a 1031 and you had 100 properties all lined up on day two of your exchange to close, you could certainly do that. But we do have limitations on the number of properties that you can identify. So once you get to day 45 of your exchange and you have to submit your identification form, there are some limitations. We talked about those limitations. If you identify more than three, you just have to make sure that the total value of all your properties on that form doesn't exceed two times the value of the property you sold in the exchange. Okay, so that's question number two. So question number three, is there any way to access the 1031 exchange money to pay for expenses associated with properties before the actual sales are completed? So can you pull money out of your 1031 exchange account to pay like an, ex an inspection cost or an appraisal or repairs? So um, as a general rule, most 1031 companies, including our company, uh, once the 1031 exchange relinquished property is closed and we are in possession of uh, the 1031 funds, we don't like to send the money out of the account um, to pay for miscellaneous items. We like to, to send the money out. If it's an earnest money deposit, certainly call us and we'll um, take 1031 money out of your account to pay for an earnest money deposit. Um, if you need that money to, to purchase your next property in the exchange, we can send the money for that. But for miscellaneous item, items, we don't necessarily like to pay mis miscellaneous items, but 
Um, if the item that you want us to pay is a valid exchange expense, meaning um, it's something that the IRS would be okay with if that expense were on the settlement statement, um, then, then technically, yes, you can ask us to pay that item as long as we're paying the item directly to the vendor and as long as that money is not going into your pocket as the real estate investor that's doing the exchange, we can pay that item um, directly to the vendor. If it's a valid exchange expense, then, th then it's not taxable. If it's not a valid exchange expense, but it does um, customarily appear on a settlement statement, we can still pay it. It just means that um, it's gonna be taxable to you. And so um, we can pay vendors directly if it's a valid exchange expense. We can also pay vendors directly if it's not a valid exchange expense, so long as that expense is something that customarily appears on a settlement statement. If it's not a valid exchange expense, again, it's gonna be taxable, but we can pay it. Um, so those are all the questions. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna pass it back over to Nate. Um, sorry, we, one more question. When you do a 1031 exchange, the question is, is if you depreciate your property down to zero, can you start your depreciation on the next property? Yeah, and that's that's why a lot of people do the 1031 exchange is they, they've run out of depreciation on, on a property and it's time to move into a newer, a newer property where they can start over. Well, if you, if you sell a property, um, if you, yeah, I mean, you can, you can continue to do 1031 exchanges forever, and as long as you do valid exchanges forever, you would never have to pay taxes, right? But, but if, if you ever come to a period of time where you sell and you don't do a 1031 exchange, then you're paying taxes not only on that property that you sold, but you're paying taxes on all the properties that are sort of in the chain of the 1031 exchange, right? And so really the only way to avoid paying taxes is, is, is to keep those properties and don't sell them during your lifetime and then just pass them on to your kids and when you pass them on to your kids, your kids get those properties at a stepped up basis, meaning they don't have to pay any of the capital gains taxes that accrue during your lifetime. They only have to pay capital gains taxes that accrue um, on appreciation that occurs after they inherit that property. Um, and so if you sell when you're alive, you'll have to pay the taxes. If you keep it and pass it on to your kids, they don't have to pay those capital gains taxes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it, it becomes a complicated formula where, you know, y so you've done 10 thir 10, 1031 exchanges and you've deferred the, ca uh, the taxes from property one to property two and from property one and two to property three and so on. Well, if you get to the 10th property and you sell that property and you don't do an exchange, then the IRS wants you to pay taxes that would have been paid on each of the 10 properties. Um, and so that you would have a... Well, n not, not necessarily. I mean, it just depends on what your tax situation is. Um, I mean, in, from my perspective, if I'm getting, if I'm going into uh, the retirement age, why would I ever sell real estate? Because real estate is a good way um, to fund your retirement, right? Real estate. Well, If you're if you're in a situation where you're in, in such dire need of, of funds in that way, um, it may be that your tax rate is so low that it's that that the capital gains doesn't even apply to you. There are so some people that if they're if, if they truly have no income, such that they have to sell a property, and that's their only income, they may qualify for like a hardship from the capital gains tax. I mean that becomes a it becomes a complicated tax question, but for the most part, if you have, if you're, if you're aging and you have, you know, real estate, you don't really want to sell it because you want to keep that real estate and have the the rent fund your retirement. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't sell and pay the tax unless unless I absolutely had to. Um, so, but good questions. Any other questions? 
Yes, sir. So, so with all of your experience with helping, you know, clients with 1031s, what would you say maybe the top one or two or three um, mistakes that, that people make with 1031s and, and how do they avoid that? If that's yeah, absolutely. So what are the, what are common pitfalls? Um, you know, we've talked about some of them. Uh, definitely a common pitfall is closing on your relinquished property and not setting up a 1031 exchange, right? Uh, another pitfall that we see a lot is, um, you know, going into that replacement property and just getting a loan that's too big for um, the transaction. And it just results in money, 1031 money, not being used towards the replacement property. And that's always a hard situation because uh, we don't find out about it until we, we receive the settlement statement. And then we're review reviewing the settlement statement and we can see that the loan is too big and we can't use all that 1031 money. And then at that point in time, uh, the lender is too far along in the loan process and they're not willing to change their loan. And so um, that's an issue. Uh, another pitfall is just like I said, waiting too long to, to go out and look for your properties. We have clients that are kind of fumbling around trying to figure out what they're gonna buy and that's a problem. Uh, another pitfall is uh, if you're selling a property and you own that property in an LLC or you own it in a corporation, some sort of an entity. And of course we know that if you sell a property and you own it in an entity, you've got to buy the next one in an entity, right? Well, if you're buying residential property and you plan on financing that purchase with a loan, the lender is not going to allow an entity to sign the loan documents, right? They're not gonna allow an entity to buy that residential property if there's a loan involved. And so you've gotta do some planning there and make sure that um, um, when you go into that new property, you're going in as an individual because if you need a loan, lenders only loan to individuals. And so when you set up a 1031 exchange, you kind of have to do some planning and make sure that um, you're selling as an individual so that you, you don't get caught with that lender not loaning you funds. Um, some, some other common pitfalls are, um, let's see, um, you know, those are probably the, the, the most common ones that I see. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, so the question is, is, okay, the 45 days is a very short period of time to identify, right? Well, is there ever a time when the IRS would extend that period of time to, uh, you know, give people more time to identify? Well, this is, a, this is a hard issue because we do have clients that will call us and say, look, um, the, properties that, the properties that I identified are just not working out for me. Will you, will you just be willing to accept this new identification form from me? We're on day 65. Will you accept this new identification form from me and just throw away the one that I submitted to you on day 35 when it was um, within that period? And of course, we can't do that because um, that's where we can get in a lot of trouble with the IRS. And so once you, as a general rule, once you pass day 45, they're, you're kind of out of luck. You're stuck with those properties that are on your list. Um, we do see extensions here and there. The types of the types of extensions that we see from the IRS are, you know, specifically this last year we had some really bad hurricanes in Florida, in Georgia. Um, so if you're in a place where if you're within that area and there's a really bad hurricane such that um, you know two or three or four weeks of your life are are just kind of wasted because you're dealing with that hurricane, then the IRS will come out with a bulletin and they'll send it to us. And they'll say, okay, if you're within this area, then we're gonna give you an extension of, a, extension of 90 days, 120 days, whatever it is. And that was, that was something that they did with these hurricanes that happened. Um, they did that, they've done it a few times, but for the most part, it, it has to be like a 9-11 type of, type of thing. It has to be a hurricane. It has to be like you know, something, some sort of a catastrophe for the IRS to um, grant an extension. It's not gonna be the type of thing where the IRS, the IRS says, oh, um, you're in a really you know, hot real estate market and it's hard for you to find a good property, so we're just gonna, going to give you an extension. That's not something that the IRS is gonna do. Yes, sir. That, 
That's a great question. So how does the IRS know that you're doing a 1031? So when you when you close a real estate transaction, whether it's at First American Title or U.S. Title or wherever, um, by law, the title company is required to fill out a 1099-S. And the 1099-S is a very basic document, but it just summarizes um, what was sold, how much it was sold for, and who sold it. Um, so, and then once the real estate transaction is done, the title company will send that 1099-S to the IRS. And so that puts the IRS on notice that a uh, that puts the IRS on notice that someone, that you, sold a property and how much you sold it for and the address of the property. Okay, so then when you file your tax return in April, the IRS is sitting there waiting. Okay, we've got this 1099-S. Now we want to know what this guy is going to do with it. Is he going to pay taxes on it or is he going to tell me that he did a 1031 exchange? So you, you do the 1031 exchange program through us and we prepare and make sure that you sign all the requisite 1031 documents, including your identification form, and then we keep that all on file. And we don't do anything with it. We don't submit that to the IRS. We just keep it on file. So then when you file your tax return, there is a form, um, 8824 form. It's just it's, it's kind of an addendum to your um, your tax return form. And it's just a very basic form where you tell the IRS that you did a 1031 exchange with that property. This is what you sold. This is what you bought. Um, you traded for you know, equal or greater value and you used all your 1031 money. And so your 1031 is great. You submit that form with your tax return. And so the IRS will compare that to the 1099-S that they received. And um, if they don't audit your file, then um, we don't hear anything else. Well, if they do audit your file, then they'll ask us um, for a copy of all your 1031 exchange documents. And then we will, pu we will go to our computer file, we'll pull your exchange documents, we'll send those to the IRS. They'll take a look at them to make sure that everything looks good. If everything looks good, you're fine. If there's a hole in that documentation, then there's a potential, you know, there's a potential issue. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, if if you if you close on that property, and on the same day of closing you receive fifty thousand dollars of cash, that's going to be taxable to you. But if you close on that property and then you have a time buffer, you know, a few months, a few years, and you have a legitimate business reason for pulling that money out through a refinance, then the general rule is is that you're not going to pay taxes on that. So refinancing after the 1031 is generally okay as long as you have a time buffer between the time that you purchased the property and the time of the refi and you have a legitimate business reason for pulling that money out. Like you pulled it out so that you could buy another piece of property or you pulled it out or you did the refinance because interest rates went down and you, you were able to get a better loan or you pulled the money out through a refi because you needed to use it to improve the property. Um, to make it better for, for your rental. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right. All right, we'd like to thank Mark Bullock. Once again, he's with First American Exchange. And I just, I just wanna do another plug. I just, when I'm sitting with my clients or in my office or over the phone and I need 1031 ser services, I, I just have so much confidence in Mark. I, I just trust them when I when I introduce our clients to you know Mark and his team, and they've just done such a fabulous job. I just like I said, no complaints from from any of my clients that have used them, and he's just done a great job. So we really appreciate Mark um, spending some time with us. Appreciate you coming down. Let's give Mark a round of applause.